Jeff Hawkins. Well, I get to follow Sue Hartfield. That is cool. So uh, this is the question that we were asked to address. Uh, is it time to try again to understand the brain and engineer the mind? Uh, I have been uh, trying to do this for the past 30 years on sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time, for the last 10 years full-time. So I don't think you'd be surprised if, uh, if I answer this question with a yes. Um, <laughs> because I've been trying to do this. But uh, I'd like to give you my philosophy about it, uh, give you some of my opinions about it, and sort of fill in some color around that question. Um, and, uh, and hopefully that'll be a, an interesting discussion point in contrast to some of the other panelists. The first question is, why should we try? Uh, it may seem obvious to you, but it's worth stating again and again. I think there's two reasons we should try to understand the brain. One is it's just the most interesting thing I can think about working on. We are, we are a species defined by our brains, and everything we've ever done is a product of our brains. So, it, you know, knowledge and questions are products of brains, and so uh, it's just the most interesting thing to do. The other thing is, I believe we can build very intelligent machines. Um, we can discuss what that will, they will look like, but, and I think these will be extremely important for uh, our security, our future, for discovering and exploring the world, and perhaps ultimately our survival as a species. So I think it has a very practical and important aspects to it as well. So, my answer to that one is it's the most important quest for humanity. That's how I feel about it. I can't imagine why everyone doesn't want to work on this. <laughs> why now? Um, did something happen to mean the 149th anniversary of MIT and the 150th anniversary of MIT? I'm going to flip this question around and say it the other way. Let's say, is there some reason why we can't do it now? There was a good argument a number of years ago that our computers weren't big enough and fast enough. That argument is not true anymore. There's arguments that perhaps we're going to discover some amazing new discoveries in neuroscience. It'll just like the Rosetta Stone, just open it up. That may happen. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen. But I do know this. We have collected and continue to collect huge volumes of neuroscientific data that have not been assimilated into a theoretical framework today. There's a ton of stuff that we just don't understand why it's like that. And so there's no point in waiting. And I actually believe uh, pretty strongly that we have what we need to succeed today. What we're lacking is an initiative and ideas, not lacking some magic formulas, new mathematicians, or whatever. It's, it's, we just need to get serious about this and take the right approach. Next question is, what is the goal? What, is, what do we want to achieve? What is it going to look like? And here you'll find there's lack of un, uh, unanimity here. People have very different opinions. I'm going to state mine. I think there's two components of what we need to find here. The first component is we need a detailed brain theory. This is the theory that is in the language of neuroscience. It explains why neurons look the way they do, why they behave the way they do, how they work together in ensembles, what the brain structures are about. It is a detailed theory that is both mathematical and information that relates in the language of neuroscience and can be tested in neuroscience. That is not the only thing we need, though. I believe we have to do something else. We have to build machines that work on these principles. Carver Mead said, you don't understand something until you build it, and he's right. We have to do this. So we want to merge these two things. It's the computer science and the, engineer and the neuroscience together. Now, I'm now going to give you an example of how I think we should go about this, the kind of things that I do. Um, and I'm not speaking for other people here. But I'm going to point out three essential neuroscience discoveries that, really inf that sort of tell you a hell of a lot about building intelligent machines. The first one is the issue of representation. A senior AI person once told me, the only thing that matters in artificial intelligence is the issue of representation. How do you represent information? We know in brains and computers are quite different. In a computer, we use typically what's called the dense representation. You might think of a byte like an ASCII code. We take all combinations of the zeros and ones, 256, we assign the meaning. Now, one thing we can say is that the, the bits don't mean anything. They have no semantic meaning. If I ask you what does the third bit in an ASCII code mean, it means nothing. It's an arbitrary assignment. When we look at brains, we see representations are very different. They're sparse distributed representations. You might see 1,000 or 10,000 cells are representing something, of which only a small percentage, 2 or 3 or 4% are active at any point in time. We can represent that by a whole bunch of zeros, like a whole bunch of bits, like 10,000 bits, of which most are zeros and are fewer ones. And what we find in brains is that the actual bits or the cells actually have semantic meaning. It's not something that's pre-assigned, pre pre it's learned. But we can say, what is a cell kind of representing at this point in time? It doesn't flop microsecond to microsecond. It means something else. And so this is a way of representing information in the brain. There's some really interesting properties about sparse distributed representations. Um, they, since they encode semantic meaning, you can do semantic comparisons. I can take two representations and say, how are they similar? How are they different in multiple facets and ways? 
I can, do, I can do generalization on semantic meaning. And there's some very cool and unexpected properties of these like mathematical properties, which I don't have the time to tell you about. But I'll tell you this. This is the language of brains. And I'm going to argue that if you're going to build a, a, an intelligent machine, and if you're going to have a brain theory, you, it's going to be built on sparse distributed representations. That doesn't mean you can't use a traditional computer to emulate that. You can. But you have to speak in the language of brains, and that's the language. The second one is neurons. Brains are made of neurons, obviously. How they work together is obviously going to be very important how brains work. This is a picture of a, of a classic cortical cell, a pyramidal cell. It has a cell body and a bunch of dendrites and synapses and so on. People realize that if you're going to understand brains, you have to understand how neurons work together. It's pretty simple. Going back 80, 70 years to McCulloch and Pitts, people have been building models and neural networks. Most of those models, not all of them, but most, and still most today, use very simple neural models, something sometimes called a point neuron model which essentially you have a cell, you have some inputs, and there's some synapses, and you train this or you learn by changing the weights of these synapses or the strength of them, and they ignore the dendrites. We now know that, we know that neurons are very, very different than this. Uh, and some of this is recent knowledge. We know that they have thousands of synapses. We now know that learning occurs mostly in the formation of synapses, not in the change of strengths. We know that synapses can form and unform very rapidly. We also know that dendrites, the branchy parts of the neurons, are very complex processing elements. This is where actually the processing occurs in the, in the neuron. And the latest, this is all in the last 10, 15 years that this has really become out. We now know that dendrites act as sort of nonlinear threshold detectors. And, and so if you're going to build a model of a brain, you have to understand the computational properties of neurons as we know them today, not as we knew them 50 or 60 years ago. In the work I do, this is a picture of the kind of neurons that we model. And I can't walk you through this, but there's a cell body that's the colored dots of the synapses that are arranged on proximal distal dendrites, et cetera. It turns out that these kind of neurons are actually very, very good for processing sparse distributed representations. The third thing I'm going to talk about is hierarchy. The brain, and we've known this back since uh, 100 years ago. Cajal wrote eloquently about this in the histology of the nervous system, that brains evolved hierarchically. You, you know, when you start with something like a, a spinal cord, you end a brain stem on top of it, then later there's a basal ganglion, the cerebellum, and the hippocampus, and the neocortex, et cetera. You're kind of layering on complexity. That's how they evolve, and that's how they structure. The neocortex itself is divided into regions, and those regions in the neocortex are hierarchically organized. And so you have hierarchies on top of hierarchies. This picture in the upper right, which represents part of the macaque monkey's brain, is actually a picture of a data structure that the brain uses. As an engineer, I look at that and say, that's the data structure. Those are sparse distributed representations in a hierarchy. You can't ignore this. And I argue if you're going to build truly intelligent machines, you have to incorporate these ideas. You have to incorporate, um, uh, well, here I can say, I'm uh, sorry, but you know, we understand a little bit about hierarchies work. They're, they're about for efficiency and, and generalization. But the point is, if you're going to actually build machines this way, you're going to have to understand these concepts and incorporate them. So these three essential discoveries, I argue, a little bit, somehow the slide got a little messed up on the map. Um, are, are actually things, the kind of things we have to look at and, and take seriously. You know, we can't ignore this. Uh, and, and our theories and our, and our models have to take that in advantage. Now, the next question I wanted to uh, answer here is, is, how can we accelerate progress? I have three suggestions. The first suggestion is that neuroscientists need to embrace theory. Some do, many don't. In fact, it was until very recently the NIH used to discourage neuroscientists from including a theoretical component to their to their, uh, their grant requests. It was like, don't do that. That's speculative, right? When we make this the process, we need to say, you, if you're going to be doing neuroscience, you have to have a theoretical framework for which to understand it. The second thing we need to do is that machine learning theorists need to embrace biology. It is astonishing how little biology most machine learning people know. It is amazing. Not all, but many. And this is unacceptable. If you really think you're building machines that work like the brain, operate the brain, I believe you have to know this stuff. And the final thing you can do is you can accelerate progress with commercial success. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, you laugh. It's a really powerful motivator. What you can do, you know, if we can take these principles and build something very commercially valuable on them, that people will say, hey, that's important. I'm going to study that. And that's what I'm trying to do. I have one last slide. I have a company called Nementa. And what we've been doing at Nementa for a number of years is we've been trying to understand how ensembles of neurons form sparse distributed representations learn sequences of sparse distributed representations, make predictions of those, and you can do this in a hierarchy. We had a, a real breakthrough about 18 months ago where we figured out how these kind of more realistic neurons can work in layers and columns, the kind of structures you see in the neocortex. And these kind of models can be, are very powerful learning tools. You can pass in uh, massive parallel data streams 
and they can discover the spatial stru uh, temporal structure in them. We're trying to turn this into a business. Uh, we're going to try to build a product on this for automatic pattern discovery and large data. But part of my goal is to motivate people and get people interested in this. In fact, these algorithms, you can read all about them if you want. There's a white paper on our website that tells you exactly how they work. So that's it. I think I've stuck posted to my 10 minutes yep. right there. Thank you.